I slumped against the wall, my heart pounding as Dad's words echoed through the living room. Rachel, in this world, a woman's power is in her silence. Grandma Edith shot him a furious glare. Silence is not power, it's submission. You're suffocating her spirit. Dad's face reddened, and he turned his wrath on me. Go to your room, we'll discuss your disrespect later. I hurried out, tears stinging my eyes. Another misstep, another punishment looming. Grandma was right, my life felt like a prison, my voice constantly muzzled. Later that night, I heard shouting from downstairs. Grandma's voice rose defiantly above Dad's angry bellows. You can't keep treating her like this. She's not a possession to control. There was a loud crash, and my blood froze. I crept down the stairs to find Grandma clutching her cheek, a shattered vase at her feet. Get out, Dad snarled. You're a bad influence. Grandma looked at me, her eyes pleading. Come with me, Rachel, please. I didn't hesitate. Grabbing her hand, we fled into the night. Grandma's little house was cluttered but cozy, filled with life and laughter. She encouraged my love for art, something Dad had forbidden as frivolous. With her, I could breathe freely. A few years later at a local art fair, I met Marcus. Charming and supportive, he seemed like the perfect antidote to my oppressive past. Your work is incredible, he said, admiring my vibrant paintings. You have such talent. I blushed, captivated by his warm smile and genuine interest. Grandma approved, thrilled to see me happy. We married quickly, and at first everything was blissful. But gradually, Marcus's subtle criticisms began. Don't you think you're spending too much time on your art? He'd ask, frowning at my paint-stained hands. The house needs more attention. I brushed it off, not wanting to see the warning signs. Grandma's concerns, however, grew harder to ignore. Be careful, Rachel, she cautioned. His words may seem harmless, but they're trying to control you. I assured her it was fine, that Marcus simply wanted what was best for our future. But deep down, unease stirred, a sense that the silence I'd fought so hard to escape was closing in once more. The morning after our frantic escape, Grandma looked at me with sad eyes. I'm so sorry, Rachel. I should have gotten you out of there sooner. I squeezed her hand. You saved me. That's what matters, she smiled wanly. Your father, I always hoped he'd change, but some people are too set in their ways. An uncomfortable silence fell until she brightened. But now you're free. Free to live, to create, to become who you were truly meant to be. Under Grandma's guidance, I blossomed. Her chaotic little house became my sanctuary, a world away from Dad's harsh rules. I spent hours painting, pouring my pent-up emotions onto the canvas. At 18, I entered my first art show selling three pieces. The thrill of that accomplishment, the joy of strangers connecting with my work, nothing compared. Grandma beamed with pride. A few years later, at another local fair, a deep voice startled me. Excuse me, miss. Your paintings? They're breathtaking. I turned to see a tall, well-dressed man smiling warmly. Something about his gaze made me feel truly seen. I'm Marcus, he said, offering his hand. And you are? Rachel? I couldn't help but blush at his intense focus. Over the next few months, Marcus became a constant presence, always supportive, always in awe of my talents. With Grandma's blessing, we began dating, and I found myself falling for this caring, enlightened man. We married quickly, caught up in a whirlwind of romance. Marcus embraced my art, encouraging me to turn our small apartment into a studio. Your creativity deserves to be nurtured, he'd insist. But slowly, almost imperceptibly, his tune began to shift. Don't you think you're spending too much time cooped up in here? He'd remark, eyeing my paint-splattered clothes with distaste. The apartment's a mess. I tried not to read into it, chalking it up to his desire for order. But the comments grew more pointed. We can't live like starving artists forever, he chided one evening, flicking at a stray brush stroke on the wall. Your hobby is distracting you from more important things. My chest tightened, Grand's warnings echoing in my mind. But I pushed them aside, clinging to the belief that Marcus only wanted the best for us. Then, like a dark cloud blocking the sun, Cheryl arrived. Marcus's mother swept in without warning, her cold eyes immediately finding fault as she surveyed our living space. Really, Rachel, she clucked, lip curling at my latest abstract piece. You've let things get quite out of hand here. Marcus shifted uncomfortably. Mother's just trying to help, dear. We could use a woman's touch around here. And just like that, the walls began closing in once more. With Cheryl's arrival, 
a palpable shift occurred in our home. Her critical gaze seemed to find fault with everything I did. Honestly, Rachel, how can you let the dishes pile up like that? She tsk, already rolling up her sleeves to take over. No wonder Marcus is dissatisfied. Marcus would shrug apologetically. She's just trying to help, dear. Let her. I bit my tongue, reminding myself that mothers-in-law could be difficult. But Cheryl's help quickly became a stranglehold. New stringent rules governed the household. My art supplies were relegated to a tiny alcove, paints and brushes scrutinized as unseemly clutter. Cheryl made no secret of her disdain for my hobbies. A woman's purpose is maintaining her home, she declared one evening over a dinner I'd burned while distracted painting. All this. She waved a hand at my rejected canvases. It's just selfish indulgence. Marcus stayed silent, avoiding my hurt gaze. I wanted to protest, to remind him how he'd once delighted in my passion. But the words withered in my throat. Cheryl's control seeped into every aspect of our lives. She criticized my makeup, my clothes, the way I swept the floors. Nothing was ever good enough. You're too soft on her, I overheard her berate Marcus one night. You need to take the reins, son. The next morning, Marcus's eyes were cold as he handed me a list of chores and budget mandates. We're going to start doing things properly from now on, he stated flatly. My mother knows best. I stared at the draconian edicts, a knot forming in my throat. This, this was exactly the kind of oppression I'd fled from my parents' home. But I was a wife now. Wives obeyed their husbands, kept their households in order. That's what Cheryl and society demanded. So I fell silent and nodded. In the coming weeks, my life contracted around me. Art supplies were banned, deemed wasteful. Cheryl monitored our finances with an iron fist, doling out a paltry allowance for necessities. We can't have you frivolously spending on those silly painter's materials, she sniffed. I mourned my creations, my vibrant colors slowly graying like my mood. Surreptitiously, I began sketching in hidden corners, hoarding pilfered pencil stubs and charcoal like treasured gems. It wasn't much but it kept me sane amid the increasingly oppressive household rules. Make the beds precisely at 6 a.m., dust on Mondays and Thursdays only, dinner on the table promptly at 6.30 p.m. Failure to comply brought Cheryl's withering scorn and Marcus's cold disappointment. I walked on eggshells, each day a battle to hold my tongue against their constant belittling. You're fortunate we put up with your nonsense, Cheryl snapped after I missed a spot whilst cleaning. I clenched my fists, desperately biting back the litany of retorts I longed to hurl. But one cutting remark slipped through. Yes, I'm so lucky to have such control over my life. The slap cracked like a gunshot. I reeled, tasting blood as Cheryl's ring split my lip. Marcus watched impassively as she grabbed my hair, yanking me close. Don't ever forget your place again, she hissed, eyes glittering with cruel satisfaction. You'll do as you're told, or I'll make your life a living hell. I shrank back cradling my stinging face as she stormed off. Marcus simply turned and followed, leaving me alone to lick my wounds. Curling on the bed that night, I traced the throbbing cut on my lip and finally let the tears flow. How could I have been so blind, so naive as to think I'd found an ally in Marcus? He was just another link in the chain, another cruel jailer suffocating my spirit. But a spark within me refused to be extinguished. I was stronger than their harsh words, stronger than their rules— I would find a way to breathe freely again. Grandma's voice echoed in my mind. Never forget who you are, Rachel. Your fire cannot be snuffed out so easily. And with that defiant flicker burning bright, I began plotting my escape. With my escape plans simmering, I attempted to keep a low profile around Cheryl and Marcus, but their disdainful glares made that impossible. What's this? Cheryl sneered one morning, holding up a pencil sketch I'd carelessly left out. She crushed it in her fist. Haven't you learned your lesson about these childish pastimes? I stared at the crumpled paper, something inside me cracking. Before I could stop myself, the words burst out. It's not a pastime. It's my passion. Her eyes narrowed to slits. Your passion? She barked a laugh. Don't be ridiculous. A woman's passion is her family, or haven't I made that clear? Seething, I opened my mouth, but Marcus cut me off. That's enough, Rachel. Don't disrespect my mother. I gaped at him stunned by his callous disregard for my feelings. The man I'd married, the one who once kindled my creative flame, was gone. This Marcus was cold, indifferent, a pale echo of his former self. 
Cheryl smirked victoriously. From now on, I'll be handling all finances. Can't have you wasting money on silly hobbies. She plucked my debit card off the counter. This is for your own good, dear. Impotent rage coursed through me, but I bit back my protests. Confrontation was useless against their united front. Over the following weeks, Cheryl's iron grip tightened until I felt smothered. She monitored every penny, allowing only meager funds for basic necessities. My art supplies, what little remained, were disposed of as wasteful clutter. A wife's role is maintaining her household, she proclaimed loftily, not indulging in silly distractions. I wanted to scream, to rage against her antiquated, oppressive beliefs, but one look from Marcus's disapproving eyes and the fire in my chest sputtered out. I was trapped, a bird in a gilded cage. My only solace came from secret messages with Lisa, my childhood friend. Late at night, I'd risk texting her about my suffocating home life, finding comfort in her outraged support. You have to get out of there, she wrote one evening. This is textbook abuse, Rachel. I traced the words, feeling both validated and afraid. Could she be right? Was this, was this really abuse? The thought made my head spin. Marcus and Cheryl were difficult, controlling even, but abusive? Surely not. I was overreacting. Pushing aside my doubts, I kept venting to Lisa, finding strength in her empathy and care. Until one fateful night shattered that lifeline. Who are you messaging? Cheryl's voice sliced through the darkness like a whip. I startled, nearly dropping my phone as she loomed over me, eyes glinting with suspicion. No one, I stammered. Just an old friend. She snatched the device from my hands. You know the rules about frivolous distractions, no exceptions. Please, it's just... Did you hear me? She raised her voice, cheeks modeling. I said no exceptions. Marcus appeared in the doorway, frowning. What's going on? Your wife was disobeying me. Again. Cheryl's tone dripped with disdain, wasting time texting friends instead of focusing on her duties. He crossed his arms, fixing me with that disapproving glower that made me shrink inside. We've talked about this, Rachel. My mother's rules are for our own good. I opened my mouth, desperate to explain, to defend myself. But Cheryl silenced me with a contemptuous look. Clearly you can't be trusted to follow simple instructions. She pried open a drawer and dropped my phone inside, along with my laptop. No more distractions until you've learned your place. The finality of the slam made me flinch. Just like that, my last link to the outside world severed. I was alone, truly utterly alone with my tormentors. Without my phone and laptop, the walls closed in tighter than ever. My only connection to the outside world had been Lisa's understanding texts. Now, even that lifeline was severed. Cheryl's iron fist ruled every aspect of our lives. Schedules, chores, budgets, all dictated her draconian policies. One errant step, one perceived infraction, brought her wrath crashing down. You missed a spot, she'd hiss after inspecting my cleaning. Again. Are you intentionally trying to disrespect me? I'd shake my head mutely, swallowing my protests as she berated me like a child. Marcus stood stone-faced during these tantrums, neither defending nor condemning me, just cold, silent indifference. Occasionally I caught him staring at me with an unreadable expression. A glimmer of the man I'd married flickered in his eyes as if struggling to surface, but it never did. One cowed look from Cheryl and that spark instantly extinguished. Why are you looking at her like that? She'd demand, voice dripping venom. The girl needs discipline, not pity. I wanted to grab him, shake him out of this toxic haze clouding his mind. Didn't he see how she controlled him too? But I knew speaking out would only provoke Cheryl's fury. So I remained silent and compliant, hoping to eventually wear her down. That strategy proved futile one evening after she caught me staring wistfully at an old canvas, reminiscing over the vibrant life I'd breathed into it. Still pining over that silly hobby? She sneered, plucking the artwork off its easel. You need to let this go, Rachel. It's unhealthy. Please. I reached for it, desperately. That means everything to me. She clutched it against her chest, lips twisting into a cruel smile. Oh, I know. Which is why I'm doing you a favor. With a savage wrench, she tore the canvas from its frame, ripping it to shreds before my horrified eyes. I could only watch, paralyzed, as she methodically shredded the colors, the life, the peace I'd found in creating. When the last scrap fluttered to the floor, she tossed the mangled frame at my feet. There. Your meaningless distraction is gone for good. 
something inside me finally snapped. I rounded on Marcus, who had entered during Cheryl's fit of destruction. "'Are you really going to let her do this?' I cried, anguished tears burning my eyes. "'She's destroying me piece by piece. When will it be enough?' He blinked, seemingly jolted by my rare outburst. For a fleeting moment, remorse flickered across his features. But Cheryl was quicker. "'Don't be fooled by her hysterics,' she snarled, grabbing his arm in a vice grip. "'She's manipulating you, turning you against your own family.' Marcus's face hardened, the shutters slamming down once more. "'Don't raise your voice at my mother,' he said, each word like a slap. "'She knows what's best.' I recoiled, feeling the weight of his callous dismissal like a physical blow. This man, this cold, subjugated stranger, he wasn't the person I fell for. Cheryl smirked in triumph. "'Now get this mess cleaned up,' she ordered, "'and no more of your self-indulgent moping, understood?' Throat burning, I could only nod. I gathered the tattered canvas remnants, cradling the ruined pieces to my aching chest. Once they'd been my salvation, a window into an inner world Cheryl couldn't touch. But now, like everything else, it lay in shreds at her feet, just another causality in her war against my spirit. Each day I could feel myself withering, smothered beneath the weight of her rules, her scorn, her absolute control. That night I cried myself into an exhausted sleep, dreaming of Grandma's warm embrace— her fierce insistence that my voice mattered. You have more strength than you know, she always vowed. Never let them silence you, Rachel. But it was hard to believe that now. I felt so powerless, so hopelessly trapped in this waking nightmare. Except, in the darkest hours before dawn, I was struck by a reckless thought, a tiny spark of defiance that would not be extinguished. Slowly, ever so slowly, I began plotting a way to reach out to Lisa again one tiny act of disobedience that could reopen the line to the outside world. It was dangerous, risking Cheryl's wrath, but I had to try, had to find a way to fan that spark into a flame that could guide me out of this darkness. I would not be silenced forever. Somehow, some way, I would find my voice again. My secret act of defiance began innocently enough, stashing pencil stubs and charcoal nubs I found around the house. Cheryl would never have allowed me art supplies, but she couldn't deny me every writing utensil. In the dead of night, I'd steal away to a neglected corner of the basement and scratch out tiny sketches on scraps of paper. Rudimentary still lifes, faces, anything to momentarily free my mind from its cage. It was risky. If Cheryl caught me, there'd be hell to pay. But I craved that fleeting escape into my own little world, the one place she couldn't control. Then one night, as I was carefully stowing my meager supplies, a tattered envelope caught my eye. It was tucked behind an old furnace grate, slightly singed but intact. My heart stuttered when I recognized Grandma's looping handwriting. With shaking hands, I tore it open and began reading, hungrily devouring every line of her reassuring prose. "'My dearest Rachel,' she wrote, "'each day I think of you and pray you found even an ounce of the freedom and happiness you deserve.' Tears stung my eyes as I consumed her empowering words, the ones I so desperately needed to hear. Grandma had always been my rock, my safe harbor against the storms of life. Reading her letters made me feel cradled in her embrace once more. I quickly found the rest of them, a small cash Cheryl must have confiscated and then forgotten in her zealousness to cut me off from any outside influence. Each envelope was like a lifeline, a reminder that I wasn't alone, that I had an ally in my corner. You are stronger than you know, Grandma's looping script insisted. Never let that bitter shrew make you forget your fire. The letters reawakened a defiant spark I'd thought long extinguished under Cheryl's oppressive boot. My art, my voice, my very identity, she couldn't erase them, couldn't grind me down no matter how hard she tried. I began devouring the letters hungrily, daring to let myself dream of an escape, a future where I could breathe freely again. The sketches grew more elaborate, infused with newfound determination. But in my haste to savor Grandma's advice, I got careless. One night, as I was returning the letters to their hiding spot, a floorboard creaked behind me. I froze, dread churning my gut as a familiar sneer cut through the darkness. Well, well, isn't this just precious? Cheryl's bony hand snatched the letters from my grasp, lips curling in distaste as she rifled through them. So that's been your little secret— she fixed me with a glower that made my skin crawl. 
reading this treacherous bile behind our backs. They're just letters, I whispered, anxiety clawing up my throat. From my grandma. They're all I have left of her. Exactly. Cheryl ripped them in half, letting the shredded pages flutter to the ground. And she's clearly been a negative influence, filling your head with delusions of defiance. She grabbed my sketch pad, methodically tearing out pages and shredding them one by one. Please. I heard the tremor in my own voice, hated how pathetic I sounded. Those mean everything to me. No. She punctuated each word by ripping another sketch asunder. They're a distraction, a crutch keeping you from embracing your proper role. I could only watch, numb with horror, as she demolished the last fragments of my identity, of everything that made me feel whole. When the final scraps drifted to the floor, she grabbed my chin with cruel fingers, forcing me to meet her cold stare. This defiance ends now, she hissed. No more letters, no more scribbling, no more of this pathetic crying. You will obey, or I'll make you regret the day you were born. Do you understand? I tried to pull away, but her nails dug into my skin like talons. Do you understand? She repeated, shoving her face towards mine. Flecks of spit struck my cheek as I shrank back, petrified. I could only manage a tiny nod. Cheryl released me with a contemptuous sneer. Good. See that you remember it? She stormed off, leaving me huddled amid the tattered remnants of my spirit. I gathered the shredded sketches, the torn letters, and cradled them against my heaving chest. Grandma's parting words, now slashed to ribbons, drifted through my mind. Never let them break you, Rachel. Never stop fighting. But as I wept over the ashes of my defiance, it was hard to see how I could ever keep that promise. After Cheryl's chilling outburst in the basement, an eerie calm descended over the house. She watched me like a hawk, looking for any hint of defiance to snuff out. I walked on eggshells, jumping at every creek, flinching from her piercing glares. Marcus, as usual, stayed silent and aloof. Whether he agreed with her tactics or simply lacked a spine, I couldn't tell. He just passively observed the slow erosion of my spirit. I knew placating Cheryl was useless in the long run. Her cruelty ran too deep, her need for domination too insatiable, but open rebellion would only provoke her wrath. So I bided my time, bottling my anger, my anguish, focusing it into a simmering determination. I would find a way to escape this nightmare. Somehow, some way, I'd break free. The opportunity came one night at dinner. Cheryl had been needling me all evening with snide remarks about my cooking, my cleaning, my inadequate performance as a housewife. Honestly, Rachel, she clucked, grimacing at the lumpy mashed potatoes I'd made. Is it too much to expect an edible meal? I grated my teeth, sorely tempted to dump the whole bowl over her head. But I remained stone-faced, silently fuming as she continued her blistering critique. No wonder Marcus is constantly disappointed. You're hopelessly incompetent. That barb struck a nerve. I opened my mouth, finally ready to unleash the torrent of anger I'd been holding back. But Marcus beat me to it. That's enough, he said, voice low but firm. There's no need to talk to her like that. We both froze, gaping at him in shock. Marcus had never once challenged his mother before, at least not in my presence. Cheryl recovered first, rearing back with an ugly scowl. Excuse me, are you actually defending this useless girl? I'm just saying there are ways to give constructive criticism without being cruel. He set his fork down, meeting her seething glare steadily. The constant belittling helps no one. An ugly silence stretched between them. I shrank in my chair, heartbeat thundering in my ears as Cheryl's complexion mottled. How dare you? She rose from the table, hands trembling with outrage. After everything I've sacrificed, you'd take her side against your own mother. Marcus faltered, shooting me an uncertain look, but a muscle twitched in his jaw, and he lifted his chin in defiance. Maybe it's time we had a serious discussion about boundaries. The resounding slap made me flinch. Cheryl's hand seemed to blur as it struck Marcus squarely across the face. You ungrateful spineless worm! She loomed over him, eyes bulging with fury. I gave up everything to raise you, and this is how you repay me? Marcus cradled his reddening cheek, stunned into silence. An ugly chuckle ripped from Cheryl's throat. I knew letting that girl into our lives was a mistake. Her glare bored into me like a laser. She's poisoned your mind, turned you against your own flesh and blood. I opened my mouth, desperate to defend myself. But the look on Marcus's face stopped me cold, a strange mixture of fear, resignation, and bitter acceptance. 
You're right, mother, he mumbled, not meeting my stricken gaze. I was out of line. It won't happen again. Just like that, the fight drained out of him. My heart plummeted, realizing this intermittent backbone had been an aberration, nothing more. Cheryl sneered in triumph. See that it doesn't. She rounded on me with undisguised loathing. As for you, you'd better start showing more respect around here. The only reason I tolerate your presence is out of love for my son. Her lip curled. Though God knows what he sees in a sniveling ungrateful wretch like you. The words lashed me like a whip. I flinched, blinking back shameful tears as she swept from the room, her scornful cackle echoing like mocking laughter. Marcus stared at his plate, shoulders slumped in defeat. I wanted to scream at him, to demand he grow a spine and stand up for me, for us. But his haunted expression stayed my tongue. In that moment I realized the bitter truth. Cheryl had him too tightly leashed. He would never defend me, never put my needs before hers. I was alone in this battle. But even that knowledge wasn't enough to extinguish the last stubborn flickers of hope, of defiance, burning in my chest. If Marcus lacked the strength to stand up for me, for our marriage, then I would have to find it within myself to stand up for us both. No more placating Cheryl, no more walking on eggshells around her venom. It was time to fight back. Consequences be damned. I was done being a passive victim. My escape may have hit a roadblock, but I would not be silenced or cowed any longer. The war was only just beginning. The distant rumble of thunder was my signal. I finished stuffing the last of my belongings into a duffel bag and crept downstairs, muscles tense in anticipation. Lisa was already waiting in her beat-up sedan, hazard lights blinking through the rain-streaked windshield. I risked one last glance back at the cold, imposing house that had become my prison. No more. I was done being a captive. Lisa threw open the passenger door, eyes wide with urgency. Hurry, we don't have much time before they realize you're gone. I nodded grimly, tossing my bag in the back seat. Just get me out of here. Hey, I don't care where we go. The engine roared to life, and we peeled out of the driveway in a spray of gravel. I watched the looming house recede in the rearview mirror, its harsh angles and blank windows already fading like a nightmare slipping from my mind. My heart hammered the entire nerve-wracking drive, half expecting Cheryl or Marcus to suddenly give chase. But the night remained dark and blissfully silent, broken only by the thrum of the wipers and the drumming rain. By dawn, we were cutting across state lines into a sleepy coastal town. The salty air clearing the lingering ache from my lungs with each reviving breath. We'll be safe here, Lisa assured me as we pulled into a dingy motel bearing a vacancy sign, at least for now. I could only mutely nod my thanks, feeling unmoored and disoriented. Just yesterday I'd been trapped in that gilded cage of a home. And now, now I was free, yet utterly adrift. The motel room was cramped but clean, its cheerful ocean-themed decor a jarring contrast to the tasteful but oppressive design of my marital home. So many memories lingered in those cold, sterile rooms. Here, I could breathe again, really, truly breathe. Lisa squeezed my shoulder, eyes shining with a mixture of worry and pride. You're out, Rach. You're finally out of that nightmare. The words hit me with a strange pang, my eyes stinging. I was out. I'd escaped. But at what cost? I don't know what to do now, I confessed in a small voice. Where do I even start to pick up the pieces? We'll figure it out, Lisa said firmly. For now, just focus on healing, on rediscovering who you are. The rest will follow. Easy for her to say. That years of conditioning under Cheryl's tyrannical rule had stripped me of any sense of identity beyond meek, obedient housefrau. Who was I, really, if not the cowering, defeated creature she'd molded me into? Lisa must have sensed my doubts. You're stronger than you think, Rach. That's why you got out. I wished I could share her conviction, but my mind kept spiraling back to Marcus and the shattered remnants of the life I thought we'd have. How could I ever trust myself or anyone again after being so thoroughly deceived? Over the next few days, I drifted through the unfamiliar town in a fog, half-heartedly job-hunting, as Lisa insisted, but struggling to imagine any future for myself beyond mere survival. I was rudderless, unmoored, suffocating beneath the weight of all I'd endured, so consumed by my inner turmoil that I nearly walked straight into an elderly gentleman on the boardwalk. Easy there, miss! The cheery voice broke through my stupor. You look a million miles away. 
I blinked, refocusing on the kindly face and warm brown eyes crinkling with concern. For some reason, his affable manner immediately put me at ease. I, sorry, I wasn't watching where I was going. I shifted the strap of my bag awkwardly. Just got a lot on my mind lately. Ain't that the truth, he chuckled, squinting against the sun. Say, you wouldn't happen to be looking for work, would you? My diner's in desperate need of an extra pair of hands. I opened my mouth to politely decline. What did I know about waitressing? But something made me pause. A flicker of possibility? Of purpose, however small? Or maybe I was just sick of drowning in my own misery. You know what? I'd really appreciate any job right about now. The old man's face crinkled into a sunny smile. Well, all righty then. Name's Trevor, by the way. Let's get you started on a new chapter. Chapter. The word struck an odd chord deep within me, stirring faint embers of the creative spirit I'd thought long extinguished. A new chapter, free from the shackles of my past. I matched Trevor's smile, the weight on my chest feeling just a little bit lighter. Sounds perfect. I'm Rachel, and I'm ready to start over.